Perfect, great. Okay, so we're going to move into our first clinical um, talk now, and dermatology is certainly something that I struggled with, and I, I had lots of worries about when I was a GP trainee. There's so many rashes and skin problems. How am I going to spot them all, especially if there's no dermatology in your training? I know it's an area that I get asked about quite a lot. So we're lucky to have Dr. Angela Goyle, who some of you might know uh, from her dermatology work, but also her lifestyle medicine work as well. So the GP is accredited by the RCGP for an extended role in dermatology, and has been seen um, skin conditions for over 10 years now, but also has a, a strong interest in lifestyle medicine. I'm sure she'll mention um, Inspired Menix, um, the company that she runs for that side. I know it's an area that a lot of GPs um, are moving into. So before we do start with Andrew, I just want to run into our fourth poll just to get an idea about whether my views as a GP training dermatology match what yours are. So if I can just launch this fourth poll about your confidence um, in dermatology, guys. So please do click. Wow, 94%, 94% uh, not confident with dermatology as a GP trainee, and that might be for a number of reasons. So Angela, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'll um, put my camera on now. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining, Sandy. That's a good start. 94% of trainees not confident with dermatology, so you've got 40 minutes to, to impact that. Brilliant. Right, okay, we've well, certainly picked a great topic if um, that's um, the response that you've had. And I have actually prepared this talk for people who don't feel so confident, because that is a common thing that I do see, um, the lack of confidence in dermatology. And I'll touch on the reasons for why that is as well. <clears throat> so I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Great. OK, well, first of all, thanks so much, Aman and Pooja, for inviting me to speak on dermatology today. I really enjoy dermatology. I love the work that I do. And it's an honour to be able to share that with GP trainees and, and help you in your journey of your training. And also, um, amazing to be following on from Professor Martin. Um, I have picked up quite a lot of useful information from that talk, and I really agree with the whole aspect of relationships in general practice. And particularly what he was saying about video consulting in general practice and how that can act, I was actually didn't know about that, but it can actually be more impactful than face to face with masks on. So that's something that I will take back to my dermatology service, because in our dermatology service, we do mostly telephone consulting with photographs. We found that to be better than video consulting or we do face to face with masks so we can examine our patients. So that's something I'll certainly be discussing with the team and something that I've learned today. Um, and the conference so far looks really well organised. So well done, Aman and Pooja for that. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll start by um, just talking a little bit about um, what I do. So I'm a GP with an accredited role in dermatology. Um, so about 15 years, actually, I was counting it up thinking, is it 10 years or is it 15 years? Um, it's actually been um, over 15 years, in fact, since I've been working in this role. And I also um, am accredited in skin surgery. And fortunately, the RCGP have actually duly accredited um, this role. So previously, um, you could specialise in dermatology, but not actually be able to verify that you're accredited. And my main role is in the NHS. So I'm a clinical lead at One Medical Group and I lead the service and I'm involved in service delivery design as well. And we take referrals from leads, but also because of the pressures on dermatology in surrounding areas, we're actually seeing patients coming in from further afield from all over Yorkshire. And just moving back to the um, point that Prof Martin um, was making about um, face to face, and um, this is how I look, the bottom picture, when I see my patients face to face at the moment, and um, I'm sure you'll agree, you know, it, it's not, I, I don't feel it's a great way to uh, see my patients when we can't see each other's faces properly, but we can't really do anything about that. That's just the way it is at the moment. So as Emma mentioned, my other role is as um, a, um, I run Inspired Medics, which is um, supporting GPs and helping um, new GPs, particularly in your careers, um, so we run events on portfolio careers and also lifestyle medicine. And um, this is something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, I've developed an interest in lifestyle medicine over the past five years. And not only does it really benefit our patients, but I find as doctors, um, it can really improve our own fulfillment in the job 
and help us be in touch with why we became doctors in the first place. So in that role, I'm also, um, I do have some voluntary uh, roles as well. So British Society of Lifestyle Medicine is a charity and one of their regional directors, UK Health Coaches Association, another charity, I'm an advisor to them. So um, if you want to know more about that, um, you can um, find out, I've put the links in on the talk to uh, the Inspired Medics, but we're really here to support uh, GPs and trainees in their journey. So this is a bit about the portfolio careers events that we run that I'm in spoke at. Right, so moving on to the dermatology talk. Um, first of all, um, I would just like to acknowledge Primary Care Dermatology Society and Dermnet New Zealand for allowing me to use their images in educational talks. And I also just want to um, make a disclaimer that I'm not being sponsored and I'm not being paid to promote any products or anything like that. This is a completely independently prepared talk by myself. If I happen to mention any products, it's just because there are so many, if you open up the BNF in the dermatology section, there are so many um, emollients and medicin medicinal topical products out there and it can be quite confusing and you only need to know a few really. So in order to simplify it, I might just uh, mention some products, but there's no conflict of interest there. Right, so as you mentioned, dermatology can be quite difficult. Um, so, I'll just move screen, sorry. And I remember a colleague of mine who's um, a few years on from me, actually. So she's been practicing as a GP for 20 to 25 years. And one day she said to me, oh, I really need your help with dermatology, because sometimes when I look at patients, it all just looks like little red dots and I can't tell the difference. And I'm just sharing this story because if you feel like that, I want you to know that that is a common feeling amongst GPs. And why is that? Why is dermatology so different, just so difficult? Well, first of all, um, have a think. Do you know how many dermatological diagnoses there are out there? So if we're on a, a live um, talk face to face, uh, I'd ask you to have a vote now and, and give me some numbers, but we, we can't do that so easily here. So I'll tell you the answer. So there are somewhere between two to four thousand different dermatological diagnoses. And if you look on Dermnet New Zealand, which is an excellent free dermatology resource, you will see that there are 2,300 dermatological diagnoses that they have created education for. So that's one of the reasons why. Another reason why it's difficult is because very few GPs actually receive dermatology training um, during their training years. So very few will do a hospital job in involving dermatology or even go and sit in any um, outpatient clinics, two-week wait clinics or community dermatology clinics. So these are some of the reasons why it's difficult. And, um, you know, with 20, we estimate that 20% of dermatology, of GP consultations have a dermatology element to them. So it, putting it together, it, it's not great, is it? So. I'm really pleased that so many of you have taken your time out today on a Saturday to come and attend um, not only the whole conference, but this, this talk on dermatology as well. So how am I going to attempt to simplify this for you today? So um, what I would say is um, go back to the simple things that you learn when you study medicine. So it's so important for dermatology. I think there's a temptation when a patient comes in with a skin problem and um, they basically give you very little history unless you inquire. So they'll say, oh, I've had this rash for a week and it's driving me mad. I'm so itchy. Oh, can you have a look at it? And they'll roll their sleeve up and present part of the rash to you. And then you may feel, and I know this is true because you know GPs tell me this, and I used to feel this before I did my dermatology training, you feel under pressure then to make a spot diagnosis. But if you want to be um, confident in dermatology, um, it's, not, it's not a specialty for spot diagnoses. It's really going back to the basics, taking a thorough history, knowing what to look for during the examination and how to examine, coming up with a differential diagnosis, 
And remember that common conditions are common. Okay, and that sounds really basic, but honestly, if you follow that, that will really help you in dermatology. So, um, when you go through the history, um, and I'm not going to teach you how to take a history, I know that you know how to do that. These are the kinds of things that are really important to find out in the history. The history of the rash, where did it begin? How did it begin? Where did it then spread to? Is it constant or does it come and go? Is it itchy? That's really important actually. Can it be painful? That can help you, for example, folliculitis can be painful, whereas eczema is itchy. Um, some people think psoriasis isn't itchy, but we see many patients who have psoriasis where it's also itchy. Um, other itchy conditions that you'll see commonly in, in general practice are lichen simplex is one of them, urticaria. Um, ask about the medical history and the family history, that will give you some clues because both eczema and psoriasis have genetic components, so there may well be a family history that will help you. Um, in the past medical history, the patient may have a history of A to P, that's uh, hay fever or asthma, so that then points towards eczema. Travel and occupation are both very important. Occupation because of contact dermatitis. Medications the patient's on are very important because that may have precipitated the rash. And are they unwell? That's part of any medical consultations and tips. Decide whether this person actually needs to be admitted. Um, again, I'm stating the obvious here, but you need a really good lighting and not all surge GP consulting rooms have great lighting. So you'll need to make sure you've got a really good lamp. A magnifier helps and obviously undress the patient. Don't be tempted because they've rolled up their sleeve or lifted up their trouser leg just to examine that part of the body. You need to examine them thoroughly. And, um, you know, I'll ask pa patients to leave their underwear on um, and then step behind, you know, examine them behind the curtain fully and explain that I need to see all parts of their skin because after all the skin is one organ. So when you're examining the patient um, think about these things okay um, like I said it's it, when you're examining it can all look very confusing like this is all just lots of red dots but once you start to break it down and think well what am I actually looking at here that um, helps you and this actually points towards different diagnoses. So the distribution, is it symmetrical or is it bilateral and unilateral or unilateral? Now this is important because if you've got somebody with a symmetrical bilateral rash, the cause of that is going to be something internal like inflammation in eczema or psoriasis. So these are endogenous causes. If it's unilateral, um, let's just say the rash is just on one arm or one leg, then you're thinking of exogenous causes, and that could be a contact or it could be an infection, for example. When I mentioned about undressing the patient, um, so for example, if you had a photosensitive distribution where there was a cutoff mark at the chest where um, the t-shirt ends and at the arms, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that if you didn't undress the patient. So even if the patient um, tells you the rash is just on their face and neck um, and they might think, oh, why does the doctor need to undress me? Because it's just here. You sort of explain that you're examining the whole skin because you'll get clues from other parts of the skin. And patients really like it when you're really thorough. So, um, you know, there's no reason why um, you would feel need to feel uncomfortable for that. Um, the special sites, the scalp, we call them the special sites, but they're um, part of this whole skin system. So the scalp, the nails, the genitals, the mouth and the flexures can also give you really good clues. So, for example, um, not as common a condition, but for example, in the mouth, you might see signs of lichen planus. Um, somebody with psoriasis may have genital psoriasis and they may be too embarrassed to tell you. So you don't have to. Um, examine the genitals unless you you know you ask them and say are the genitals in, in affected and if they are then examine them and the patients are actually really grateful that you've taken the trouble to inquire about that because they may have felt too embarrassed to tell you 
And again, the nails, um, it's important to look at those. That can also give signs for psoriasis as well as other conditions. The morphology is when you zoom in really and you look closely at the actual lesions on the skin. And these are the kinds of things to think about. So you'd have come across all this probably in medical school training. Um, you know, you might have thought, well, what's the relevance of these Latin terms, erythematous, um, bellacious, macules, pustules? But actually, it does lead back to the diagnosis. And that's what you're always trying to do. So, for example, if you um, feel the rash and there's nothing to feel, it's flat, there's no scale. Um, and what, what you're looking at is um, patches, so they're not, patches are not raised and they're larger than a centimetre. Um, and this rash was very itchy. So that could be urticaria because you wouldn't expect urticaria to have an overlying scale. You'd expect it to occur in patches. Whereas if you had um, a reddish rash, so erythematous, and you felt it and it was, um, it felt a little bit slightly scaly, it wasn't very well defined um, and it's very itchy, you might be thinking of eczema. So these kinds of terms are helpful because they help lead you to the diagnosis. It's not just um, to make us a sound clever in dermatology. Right, so um, you might be a little bit worried because I mentioned about the 2,300 uh, dermatology pages on Dermnet and I'm not suggesting that you go away now and read them all. So the purpose of this talk is really to simplify dermatology and point you in the right direction of what's important to learn about so you can actually start to feel confident. So I'd like to talk about the top five. So these are the top five dermatology conditions that um, you are likely to encounter quite regularly in dermatology in general practice. So these are, um, just move my screen slightly. Oops, sorry, just bring that back. So um, the top five things that you'll see I've listed here, and it's really, um, I think you could quite easily um, just go away and learn about these conditions and the basics of managing these. And if you get really good at recognising them, you'll also recognise when you get an atypical presentation, say of eczema, or an atypical presentation of psoriasis. And it's more likely that you will see some an atypical version of these conditions than something really rare in that 2300 list. So my first tip is get to know these conditions really well, and we will cover some of these during this talk today. And then the next 15 um, diagnoses, once you've mastered the first five diagnoses, I would suggest that you learn a bit more about these conditions. Um, and some of these are more common than others, such as rosacea. Some of them are put in because it's important to recognise them, such as dermatitis and petiformis, that's um, to gluten sensitivity. Um, and that's really important because it's that's something and it's actually curable almost in dermatology. So if the patient em emits gluten from the diet, they can stop having this troublesome um, itchy skin condition that may have been misdiagnosed as eczema for many, many years. So, um, so there are some conditions it's important to know about because they are um, more significant and they're red flags and you don't want to miss them. So blistering rashes, um, such as pemphigus and pemphigoid, you'd want to refer on to secondary care, so you'd, you'd want to recognise those. Um, vitiligo and rosacea, you will see regularly in general practice. So I'd say master the first five and then think about the next 15. And I'll also in this talk cover a couple of other diagnoses I've not mentioned in these list, lists, because I think it's important to recognise them so that you don't miss anything um, more significant skin cancers and severe infections. Right, so the aim today is to feel more confident in dermatology. So let's start looking at some cases. Right, so when you look at this image, I would like you to um, have a think now in your head or say it out loud um, about how you would describe this rash. 
because as I mentioned, it's the, um, the terminology that you use to describe it will help lead to the diagnosis. And I'll give you some history because I did say that history is um, important. Um, so this is a young person, sort of late teenager. They um, have had this rash creeping up, they would say for about six months. Um, initially it would come in small patches and then clear and then it would return again and now it's just not going, it's quite stubborn. And it's not particularly itchy, it is flaky. And if you ask about the family history, I won't say which condition it is, but there was a positive in the family history. So that might you might look at this and recognise it straight away. Even if that's the case, I want you to think about, because it's not spot diagnosis, I want you to think what in the history can make you more confident that this is a diagnosis and what features in the examination will make you feel more confident. So the features to look for in the examination, well, is it unilateral or bilateral? Clearly it's bilateral, it's erythematous, or you could call it a salmon pink colour, somewhere in between the two, isn't it? It's very well demarcated, isn't it? And it's on the extensor surfaces. You can see a silvery scale on the plaques. And one of my tips is, um, if you're considering the diagnosis that we'll come to, just scratch the plaques and see what happens. So you scratch the scale on the plaques a little bit, with your fingernail, and what you see is an increasing amount of silveriness when you do that. So this is another picture, the same diagnosis. Again, we, can, well, we can't see if it's widespread or bilateral from this picture, but what we can do is look more closely at the morphology of the lesions. And it's the same condition. They're well demarcated. They have a silvery scale. These ones I would say are more salmon pink. And um, again, if you were to scratch that scale, you would see the scale increase. So you may have um, guessed this one. Um, it's chronic plaque type psoriasis. And again, um, like I said, it's not about making the spot diagnosis because you want to be really confident. So this patient had a positive family history for psoriasis. It didn't have any history of ATP. Um, it wasn't particularly itchy. That points you more towards psoriasis, although psoriasis can be itchy. And the reason you want to be confident is because sometimes patients won't respond to the treatment that you give them. And there's often a tendency in general practice then to think, right, we'll switch to treatment. Let's give antifungal now. Um, or let's give an anti-yeast shampoo and see if that works. Maybe it's pityriasis with rosea. So if you get the history and examination and you document all this and, and you feel more confident, you're more likely then to think, no, it is psoriasis. It's just that I need to give a stronger treatment for it. So these are the features that I've mentioned. And it's also important to have a differential diagnosis in the back of your mind. So if things aren't improving, what else could it be? So tinea um, and psoriasis can have similar features. Tinea tends to be unilateral though. So to, to affect both um, knees at the same time would be quite unusual. Um, I mean, it can do, but it often would start unilaterally. So remember I said about, ask about the history of how it started. It'll be discoid eczema. Discoid eczema is incredibly itchy and not so well-defined and wouldn't have that salmon pink appearance to it, wouldn't have quite as much silvery scale on it, would only be very slightly scaly. But good to have that in the back of your mind when it's not as clear-cut, because these are quite clear-cut pictures. So I've talked about clues to the diagnosis. Other things would be to examine the special sites, so the scalp, the ears, the umbilicus. If there's signs of psoriasis there, you can become more confident that this is um, psoriasis. In a young person, they're less likely to have the nail changes, but you never know where they're examining the nails. And you're looking for things like pitting, subungal hyperkeratosis, onycholysis, which is lifting of the nails. Um, you might want to take mycology. Um, It'd be worth, if there's a GP in your practice who um, knows how to do mycology, it's worth learning how to do that. It just rules out tinea infection so that you're not just going to switch treatments, you think, make a positive diagnosis of tinea. And as I mentioned, the family history is more common in younger um, people with psoriasis.
So um, I put this on here because um, with psoriasis, you've got to remember this is a chronic multi-system disease and it's not just, it's more than a skin disease. It's important to ask about what's the general well-being. Um, do they have any features of uh, psoriatic arthritis? Just ask, you know, any pain or joint problems. Um, especially in older people with psoriasis, think about other comorbidities that exist with psoriasis. So treat it as a chronic disease and remember about comorbidities, particularly mental health. So I've created this model, WellSense, um, which reminds you about asking about these things. But I'll touch on that at the end, okay. So management of psoriasis, I think the key is making the diagnosis. I'm going to focus more on diagnosis during this talk, um, just because of time, really, because um, obviously you could speak all day about dermatology. But um, remember, emollients are really important. That will help remove a scale so that your treatment can work. Often treatments don't work because they just can't penetrate through the scale. Um, you can also use products like cocoas and ointment to help remove the scale scale or sedco ointment um, which will help remove scale for people with really thick scale and then in terms of treating the actual psoriasis I mean Dolabet or Enstelar which are dual therapies are the most effective I know they're not included as first line on the NICE guidelines but they are included first line on the primary care dermatology society guidelines because we feel in dermatology that if you start messing about with single treatment so a, a vitamin D analogue um, and a steroid separately, it just takes ages for the patient to improve. By that time, they give up and they'll go and see lots of different other practitioners in your practice and um, they'll just feel really demoralised and come back and ask for a referral. And um, this does happen. Beware of using um, topical steroids in psoriasis because this just can lead to rebound flares once they stop the treatment. Right, okay, next case. So, um, this is, um, as you can see, it's somebody's foot. You can just about see the other foot in the picture. Um, but have a think about what you can see here. So what you're looking at is erythema of the sole of the foot that's spreading up the side of the foot. It looks quite well demarcated. Uh, you can, if you look at the nails, you can see a thickening. Um, History-wise, the patient's troubled by a lot of itch. This rash came up on the left foot first, but it's also after about six months spread to the right foot. And they've been struggling with this for over a year. They've tried lots of different creams already from your colleagues. They've tried topical steroids. They've tried caniston. They've been to the pharmacist and tried various treatments. Um, and nothing's helping and they're fed up. So. Any thoughts on this one? Have a, have a think. The, the most important clue in the history is this started on the left foot. So it's actually the history that gives you the clue more than the, even though it's a great image, I would say the history is what clinches a diagnosis. It started on the left foot and it was there for four or five months before it spread to the right foot. So this tells you it's something that's come from outside the body, not inside. So you're not thinking of um, condition and um, that's endogenous like psoriasis or eczema as much you're thinking of could it be a contact allergy or could it be tinea now if you look at the nails that's really suggestive of tinea isn't it that's probably where the infection started from from the nails and spread to the foot so my money's on tinea here okay this, this is actually um tinea but you would be right to consider allergic contact dermatitis and um, again it's just the history it started on the left foot so if you have a rash that starts unilaterally on one hand or one foot before spreading anywhere else for you know, a few weeks or months, always exclude tinea. So this is tinea until proven otherwise. We've got a similar picture here. We have um, a rash, we can only see one hand, we can't see the other one. So I can tell you the other hand is clear, erythematous and scaly, um, very itchy. So again, I want to reiterate the point that it's tinea until proven otherwise. And treatment for tinea is very simple, straightforward. It's just a Lamisol cream. Um, you might sometimes need to use oral treatment, but many of these patients just haven't had the right treatment in the beginning. 
and, and that can be enough to clear it up. Um, and I'm talking about the skin infection. Obviously, for toenail infections, you would need oral treatment, but the patient is, um, it's about what matters to the patient, isn't it? The patient's bothered about the skin problem because that's itchy rather than the nails. So um, that's my tip for Pinia. Think about it if you've got it on just one hand or foot. And again, we have another rash here. Can you, can you see my mouse if I just go over the picture? Can you tell me if you can see my mouse here? All right. Okay, I'll assume you can. Um, but this is um, another rash. It's not as obvious as the other ones, but what you're looking at is um, an erythematous rash, which looks slightly scaly. You can see these little bits of scale, white scale here. Um, it looks annular, doesn't it? So in the middle, it looks clear, but you can see this ring here. So tinea can also look like this. This is something you've probably come across, ringworm. Again, it's on one hand, and that's the biggest clue, and it's itchy. Right, okay, this is another a case. So I'm sure when you're doing your home visits, this is a common presentation. Um, so we have here um, one um, leg, um, in, in a, obviously the patient's got two legs, so, but in on one leg it's erythematous, it looks a little bit swollen, and when you feel it, it's quite warm. The patient complains of pain, swelling, and it's come on quite quickly. So this is cellulitis, and you treat that with oral antibiotics, and you might want to consider IV antibiotics. If you wanted to get worse, you'd have to admit the patient. Always a good idea to mark with a pen so you can see if this is spreading and if you have to admit the patient. So what about um, this? Is this bilateral cellulitis? And this is something that gets diagnosed a lot, and it, it's not bilateral cellulitis, okay? Bilateral cellulitis is actually very rare. If you see a pair of red legs, it's unlikely that an infection would have come along and infected both legs at the same time. And often in this kind of case that you'll see, you get a history that this is chronic, it's been going on a long time, it's not particularly painful, sometimes it becomes painful, maybe because of secondary in infection. Um, and you might have a history that the patient's either um, immobile, or they may have had surgery in the pelvis, or they're obese, so that the veins aren't working so well and blood isn't returning back up the system and up the veins like it should be. And if you look closely, you'll see this browny red pigment, so we call hemocederin, and it's like a dusky red, isn't it? And you can see the swelling, press down with your finger, you'll see some pitting edema. So this is actually um, venous eczema. This is venous change, and and the veins aren't working very well, this has led to changes in the skin um, because of that. So you treat that totally differently with compression, elevation, topical steroids, um, if there's itching or breakdown of the skin as well. And a lot of education about um, being as mobile as possible. Right, okay, so I did want, although I'm focusing mainly on rashes, I just wanted to talk about skin cancer because um, I think everybody fears missing a skin cancer, including me, um, because they're not always obvious. Now, in this case, I think you can agree that this is pretty obvious, um, that there's something sinister going on here, and you'd refer that, wouldn't you, on a two-week wait. Um, but sometimes it's not so obvious, and this is what we all worry about. So um, on the we have a superficial basal cell carcinoma here, and we have a melanoma here. With a melanoma, um, if you look from a distance, that's my tip, you will see the ugly duckling sign. So this um, lesion is standing out much more. It is very different to this chap's other moles. So that's my other tip. Always look from afar when you're examining moles and think, does it stand out? That's the ugly duckling sign. When you're looking at lesions, these are the kinds of questions that you'll be thinking about. History of sun exposure, immune suppression, how long has the lesion been there? How quickly is it changing? Um, when you're examining, looking for symmetry, um, and use the ABCDE method. So, is it asymmetrical? What's the border like? Colour? And as you can see in this picture, this one's quite um, asymmetrical, and that's a red flag sign for melanoma. 
if you see something with a lot of scale on it, like in this picture, um, and, and it's not always so, I mean, I've, I've chosen a picture where it's pretty obvious, you might not feel so confident with this one, but do remove the scale because underneath, the scale and the cross doesn't really tell you what's going on here, it could be anything, but underneath you can see there's some sinister process going on here, and this one's an SCC. Sorry, Angela, yeah. we're running out of time, so just last oh, right. minute, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. I'll just skip through the rest. I'll just mention quickly eczema hepaticum. You don't want to miss that one. So have a read about that one. That's a painful skin condition. Can occur with people in eczema and is um, viral infection. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, start to close now. So remember about basic lifestyle tips with your patients as well. Safe sun exposure. Um, sun protection depends on the patient's skin type as to how careful they need to be in the sun. Remember about emollients, best one being the one that the patient will use. Prepayment certificates are really important so they can get en enough quantities of what they need. And um, stress is often a big factor with patients with dermatological problems. So um, discuss it, you know, acknowledge their mental health and their general well-being and how their skin condition has impacted on them. They'll really appreciate that. Um, this is all going to be in the handout, some interesting information about diet and acne. Um, there is a link with high GI foods, um, a weaker link with dairy, but there's a lot of confusion out there as to whether um, food is implicated in acne. So worth just reading this later on in the handout. And if you want any more resources from me, then um, you can contact me through the website www.inspiredmedics.co.uk. If you're interested in lifestyle medicine, which I've not really had a, a chance to touch on today, but it's all about how we um, help our patients as a whole person, taking into account the lifestyle factors, patients from all um, backgrounds, whether they're socially back um, deprived background or um, you know, and, and how we help these people be social prescribing as well. Something that makes us feel more fulfilled in our own jobs. And if you want to contact me, like I said, you can email me, that's my contact details, or contact me through the website if you want information on developing a portfolio career. If you're thinking of that or if you're interested in dermatology, I'm more than happy to um, help you out or support you in whatever way is needed. So I think I've just managed to um, keep the time, Pooja. Thanks, Angela. Really appreciate it. Um, it's only because you're getting a whole stream of questions. So lots of positive comments. I know it's really hard to do dermatology without seeing the audience engaging with you, especially when you've got pictures on there. So thank you. Uh, a great, great update in dermatology. It certainly improved my knowledge of, about how to assess dermatology rashes and conditions. So Angela, if it's okay, we're going to allocate some questions for you to answer um, just privately, but if we could just run through a couple now. I mean, do you want to go through them? Uh, yeah, so someone's asked um, about courses. Angela, firstly, thank you so much. That was really useful. Um, sometimes the, the more basic dermatology bits are often forgotten, all the more specialised kind of ones that you see once in a career are often the ones that people remember. So that was really useful to go through some of those um, more common presentations. So yeah, one question's come in really quickly about courses in dermatology. I think a lot of people think about being a gypsy in dermatology at some point, but any particular courses you'd think about whilst being a trainee? Yeah, I think um, if you look on the, um, for dermatology, look on the Primary Care Dermatology website. They run some excellent courses for specifically, I mean, often um, led by people like myself who are GPs with a specialist interest. So it's really focused on what you need to know in dermatology. Um, sign up to Inspired Medics as well, because we do run some training in dermatology from time to time. Um, and again, we'll, we'll pitch it at the level of the audience. So depending on whether it's basic knowledge or, or more detailed. Well, and just one final question, what are the best resources for GP trainees and GPs that you'd recommend from a dermatology point of view? So I think um, the, the primary care dermatology website is excellent. 
So they have some A4 um, guidelines for common conditions. I mean, I was involved in writing the one on psoriasis, for, and they've got them also for actinic keratosis, for um, acne. Two pages, that was one of our aims, to keep it to no longer than two pages. It gives you tips on diagnosis and management. Um, and also um, the British Association of Dermatology website, they have some excellent resources for patients, videos as well, and um, they also have leaflets in different languages. That's really useful, Brilliant. thank you. Brilliant. Um, so guys, for those of you asking the handouts, it has been added to your control panel. So if you look in the control panel, um, usually on the right of the screen, there'll be a little section called handouts. If you click on that, you can download the handout and we'll be keeping that on for at least an hour so you can um, look at all those slides with a bit of time. And as you mentioned, and we forwarded on all the questions that we could see, there's quite a few that have come in the last couple of minutes as well, um, onto Angela. So hopefully, Angela, you can see on your side that there's some questions that are flagged to yourself. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through those and I'll answer those now. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and just as Angela mentioned, those of you who are still asking about courses and to get more information, as Dr. Angela said, please check out her website, www.inspiredmedics.co.uk, is it, Angela? We'll right, put it yeah. We'll put it in the chat function for you to click on as well for more information, and you can contact her through there. So um, forward any questions you have, and uh, we'll forward them on to Angela. But thank you ever so much, Angela, for a great talk. Always a pleasure having you here, so thank you. Thanks so much and thanks for inviting me. Bye. Thank you.